So uh, welcome to our 15th uh, fireside chat. It's hard to believe that we're on number 15 already. Um, I'm Craig Galati with LGA, and we're sure glad that uh, you're here to join us today. Um, thank you for constantly showing up to these important conversations. Um, we began these chats as a way to connect with our clients and our colleagues around important issues that face our community and how we as designers and community members can work together to create some great places, um, places that are worthy of stories and worthy of remembering. So before we jump in though, I have a little bit of logistics. Um, we have a chat feature and uh, we encourage you to ask questions or provide comments or thoughts throughout the talk. We do have a specific time built in to answer those questions kind of towards the end, but I'm gonna monitor the chat and if something that is relevant at the time, I might uh, jump in and, and ask that question. So. Uh, we'll see how things are going on that. But uh, one other item is that this chat is being recorded um, and it's going to be available on our website uh, within a week or so. And I believe if you signed up, we're going to send you a link. So um, you can watch it again and um, and kind of continue to take it on. So anyways, uh, Brittany Blake, uh, with, uh, LGA's marketing director, is going to be interviewing our panelists today. So why don't we jump right into this? Today's fireside chat is entitled Plants to the Rescue, How Gardens Affect Our Health, Our Minds, and Our Future. As a, Deva a desert, Nevada possesses a challenging climate for the average gardener. Despite this, the benefits of gardening, both mental and physical, have been well documented and can help contribute to a balanced lifestyle. This chat will focus on the importance of gardening, both at home and community-wide, as well as the best practices that gardeners can use to succeed in an in arid environment such as Nevada. So Brittany, I'm gonna sign off, you take it away. All right, sounds good. Well, this is my first time facilitating the fireside chat and I am really excited that I get this one. Um, I don't have it nowhere near the garden acumen as our panelists here, but I definitely, uh, I, I make an effort. So <laughs> I'm really excited to, um, to get this uh, conversation started. So with that, I wanted to introduce um, Brian Valinga. He is the owner and operator of Garden Farms in Nevada. Uh, I think that's his official title, but I did get his email and it said he was the CFO, which I read the fine print was the chief farming officer. So that was uh, quite funny. I liked that. Um, Brian is originally from Montana and he moved to Las Vegas in 1987 and has been in the landscaping and gardening industry here in the Valley for over 31 years. I think a lot of people on this call uh, know him. Um, Brian graduated from Clark High School here in Las Vegas and obtained a degree in horticulture at CSN. He worked as the director of horticulture at multiple resorts, both in Las Vegas and Biloxi, Mississippi, um, before he and his wife, Brittany, started Garden Farms. Um, he has successfully proven an uncanny ability to grow vegetables and fruit trees throughout our harsh desert climate. Uh, in his spare time, he enjoys fly fishing, food preservation, and spending time with his wife and family. He has got five kids and four grandchildren, and of course, he enjoys gardening. So thanks for being here, Brian. Um, next, I have Vanessa, who is also with uh, Garden Farms. She's the executive director of the foundation side. Um, she was born and raised in Las Vegas, and while studying for her bachelor's in cultural anthropology at UNLV, she spent a semester abroad in Costa Rica. Uh, after spending some time in the rainforest, the dry forest, and the cloud forest, uh, she became fascinated with plants and their life cycles. Upon her return, she moved to North Carolina and became a certified clinical herbalist and began working with children through plant education and creating a children's herbal medicine line. She has moved back to the West Coast and her focus shift towards agriculture, and she fell in love with the idea of replacing lawns and ornamentals with edible varieties, which I love. i um, excited to hear more about that. Um, and she has uh, joined Garden Farms in 2015 and has since had the opportunity to use her skills um, educating children and adults um, all about um, uh, gosh, food cultivation skills and discovered her true love for sustainability, not only for our environment, but for food accessibility. So thanks, those are quite the, quite the bio. So I'm really excited for your guys' uh, backgrounds and, and we're gonna go ahead and get, get right kicked off. So um, Brian, I, I wanted to touch a little bit about how Garden Farms came to be and um, how, what has inspired you to make you know, gardening your career and, and 
this life, you know, your life's work, basically. Yeah, great question. Uh, and thank you for having us here. We, we love uh, participating in things like this. Uh, that write up about Vanessa was just half of the story. <laughs> she she really runs the place and she <laughs> she deserves all the credit. But uh, my wife and I did start the business, uh, you know, 2010, I think, uh, around there. Um, but before we started the business, we were avid vegetable gardeners. And uh, we used to grow vegetables just in our community, in our backyard. My degree is in horticulture, as you mentioned. And so in college, we used to grow a lot of vegetables in the greenhouses and just outdoors, um, right out there in Henderson, actually, right up on the hill. And uh, uh, John Smith was my uh, you know, professor, and uh, he taught me everything he knows about growing vegetables. And so that was probably the most fun that I had out of anything that I did. So obviously I went on to, you know, be a horticulturalist and landscaping and, uh, but vegetable gardening was just kind of a hobby and a passion that, that we just loved doing. And uh, we've just kind of said to ourselves one day, you know, we had so many people asking us so many questions about growing vegetables and how we were so successful. And we thought to ourselves, I wonder if we could actually do this as a business and uh, the idea was born. Um, we bought a truck and started helping people grow food in their backyards. And it's ballooned into what it is now today, um, primarily just because we filled a, a void. And that is people wanted to connect with their food again. They wanted to connect with the earth, the soil. They just kind of wanted to know where it came from. And then it ballooned into schools and community centers and hospitals and restaurants and parks and and cities and organizations and and now we we are uh pretty well known throughout the community as a, a an expert in vegetable gardening at least in this region um in southern nevada uh to, to and that's really our mission statement is to just kind of help people empower people to learn how to and to be able to grow their own food um, for all the reasons that i just mentioned um, but the idea was probably just born from an early passion back in college, uh, you know, many years ago. So as you mentioned, um, you know, what, how, how does Garden Farms offer, you know, I know you guys offer courses. Um, how, how do you educate the public? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have a, a variety of different services that we provide. But at the root of it, it's teaching people how to grow food. Um, and so uh, we like to say that we bring the college university growing experience to you in your own backyard and, uh, you know, people setting up vegetable gardens for people. We, we get a lot of phone calls from I did it the wrong way or I don't know what I'm doing or I don't know how to do it. And so we kind of just help them along the way. We help them build the garden. We help them service the garden. We help them plant the right vegetable at the right time of the year. And so uh, that's probably our main our main service um, that obviously branched into commercial operations. So, you know, we've had restaurants where we've put uh, vegetable gardens out in their back doors, schools, and they can harvest all these all this food and use it in their operations as well um, with the, with an attempt to kind of grow locally. Um, and we've actually worked for a lot of people on this list here of the attendees. I recognize a lot of the names. We've worked in conjunction with a lot of people who've also designed vegetable gardens uh, along the way. And so, uh, you know, it's been a community and a group effort for sure. So we have a farmer's market, an online farmer's market that we run. That was born out of the idea that people needed a place to sell their excess food so we help people become certified producers and then sell their food on our online farmer's market, which anybody can just go on and buy from local producers, um, local produce each week, and then we deliver it to their door. And then uh, I'll let Vanessa talk a little bit about the foundation. We have a nonprofit foundation as well, and I'm probably leaving out a few services as well, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. So uh, Vanessa, do you wanna mention the foundation and what that does? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're able to, through the foundation, um, you know, kind of use our community support to help bring gardens to people who really need it, um, people in low income communities or in food deserts. Um, and we will do programs um, from seed to plate. So being able to start with a volunteer effort and building a garden for them in their space 
sending a farmer and a nutrition teacher to teach them how to grow. Um, so we'll start with planting the seeds. We'll teach them how to grow along the season as it runs and how to eat well, why nutrition is important, even just the basics, you know, just the basics of like how to read a nutrition label um, and, you know, kind of combining all these efforts as we go so that at the end when we have all of our fruits and vegetables ready to harvest, we bring a chef, we make a meal to celebrate everything that we grew um, and also to teach them how to prepare it. So we'll use vegetables um, that we will use, uh, we'll get other vegetables. We won't use it from their garden. So we'll say, we'll get a bunch of arugula, make something, say, this is how you can prepare the arugula that's growing in your garden. And this is how you can eat Swiss chard. This is how you can incorporate these into your meals. And so at the end, we're able to celebrate everything that we did, leave them with a fully harvestable garden and the tools to just regrow. Yeah, that uh, is amazing. Yeah. And so, you know, and that, that is along all ages. I mean, we do that for um, a lot of senior communities here in the Valley, um, but we also do a lot of school programming for kids, um, you know, beyond that time that they spend with their farmer, um, being able to run farmer's markets where the kids are actually packaging and marketing and selling the produce there behind the table. And they kind of see the the whole idea behind a market and how it runs and, um, you know, being able to tie in their gardens to their classroom curriculum. So how to use the garden for reading and writing and art and social studies and, you know, creating this space where, you know, our lives revolve around food. Um, mm -hmm. And so having the garden um, be this place where the community culture revolves around as well um, is just as important and be it you know growing food or uh, culinary skills or art or a therapeutic um, yoga in the garden healthy movement um, just finding a way to tie it in to anything that people are interested in is pretty much the root of of our foundation just making it accessible to everybody love that you, you mentioned nutrition, so I wanted to kind of, that was a good segue to the, the next question. So um, I put on here that Greek uh, physician Hippocrates, um, he was, lived 2,400 years ago, and he was saying, you know, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So this is, I mean, this is not a, a new notion um, that the importance of nutrition um, to our overall, our overall health. Um, and I know like the more we're removed from our, our fresh fruit and, and vegetables, like the more degraded and the less nutrients it's, it's containing. And so um, I wanted to have like a little open, open dialogue about, yeah, fresh fruit and, and vegetables to our overall health and, and well-being. And you touched a little bit on that, but do you have any like specifics? I know it's Vanessa for you, your background for sure. I think yeah. you would have be a great place to start. Let me just say one thing real quick before I turn that question to Vanessa, because she does have extensive background in nutrition and uh, herbs and just healing through uh, through food and vegetables, is that uh, we knew that we had to, we knew that garden farms had to do more than just, if we wanted to change the world, one vegetable garden at a time, and, and I don't necessarily mean that jokingly, we knew we had to teach kids. We knew we had, mm -hmm. we knew that kids were a component of this. And uh, we pretty routinely found uh, that children did not know where their food came from and they didn't connect with it at all. Um, and, and so that kind of led us into the school garden movement. And, and uh, you know, actually it's a small, school gardens are a, a portion of what we do, but it's, it's not all we do. It's not even really our, our main focus, but it, but that, and then that teaching gardening to kids led us to transition into the nutrition side of it. I mean, Vanessa didn't mention it, but she's written an entire, her and, and the uh, Cooperative Extension have written an entire curriculum for kids to learn about food and just about all the STEM uh, classes and stuff that they can learn in the garden. But anyways, that being said, I'll let Vanessa answer the, the nuts and bolts of nutrition and food and how it does heal. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, um, when I first saw this question, um, what immediately came to my mind is, you know, beyond just incorporating uh, fresh fruits and vegetables into our diet is incorporating local 
um, fruits and vegetables into our diet. Um, and I think that more than anything, that's that's the most important part of our nutrition. Um, being able to eat in season um, is does something specific to our bodies that we need. Learning, living in tune with nature starts with eating what's around us. And when we start eating watermelon in December, and you know we're we're trucking all these things in from faraway places and not only does that make a huge impact you know on our environment but just on our bodies as well um and you know there's through herbalism um there's through like the wise women tradition um they say that any medicine that you need will always be within um 100 yards of 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 you at any given moment that said, like weeds um, and, and what we consider weeds are typically really, really nutritious um, for us. Like dandelion is so important to us, um, such a great liver cleanser. And it's like dandelion is all over the place. And, um, you know, and, and so just kind of thinking the same along the same lines with our fruits and vegetables and just eating in season is, is really important um, and understanding you know, how to eat in season and why, you know, and also just doing that for yourself. I, I think that, you know, sometimes we'll go and we'll, we'll be growing, you know, potatoes and someone will be like, oh, well, I can just go to the store and buy a bag of potatoes for, you know, and sure. But the difference is, first of all, the quality of what you're growing compared to the bag of potatoes that you're buying in the store is incomparable. I mean, there's just nothing like the taste of fresh, freshly grown fruits and vegetables, that, and especially you growing that yourself and you mm -hmm. growing through the process of like tending to that plant. Um, there's something really magical in it. And I think that that does, that serves us even better as far as like nutrition. Um, it serves us even better than if I were to just eat a bunch of fruits and vegetables from the market. Um, it's just something in tune with living with nature that really serves us, um, just us in, in entirety. Yeah. And, and let me just add one last thing about that in, in that the, the part that's hard for everybody when it relates to food and gardening is changing our ways. Like, mm -hmm. and with kids, for example, it, like Vanessa said, if, if we, we really like having watermelon in December, we like eating tomatoes in January, we like bananas, we, you know, that's just, we've come accustomed to having that and just, we, we want it, we just go buy it. But to change our mindset and think, I'm going to grow my tomatoes, store them so I can eat them through the winter, or, or eat them only in season is, is a different mindset that really us city slickers here, we just don't understand it quite. And so, you know, that's where the kids come in. If we can teach them to kind of get that concept at a young age, they might take it with them into adulthood. So. Yeah. I love that notion of starting with the kids and the, and generationally, you know, mm -hmm. moving the needle that way. Um, I, you guys kind of mentioned the, the, the society in general is, is looking to garden more and more, but I'm, I'm wondering specific to the pandemic, um, just everything that the aftermath that came along with that, you know, lockdowns and food shortages and scarcity. Um, was there a, 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 an even more renewed sense of, of people wanting gardens and, and um, you know, control over their food? Yeah. Did you so see a connection? A, that's a great question. We, so we're not, we're not, we don't really qualify or classify ourselves as like at the preppers, you know, grow a garden so that when the crap hits the fan, we'll be ready. Because truthfully, uh, you know, you, you'd have a hard time growing enough food to support supply for your whole family just in a small little box in your backyard, you know. So, but, but the knowledge of, of gardening and the hobby of gardening brings with it so much more than just food. You know, it's, Kind of, it's putting your hands in the dirt, connecting with Mother Earth. It's therapeutic. It is uh, incredibly peaceful and relaxing. Um, it can be stressful, I guess, at times, but mostly it's relaxing and, and therapeutic. And so when the pandemic hit, we found that people did turn to gardening as a way to deal with what can I do outside that's around my house that will help me kind of relax and calm down and 
So it wasn't so much for the food, like you probably would think it was probably more for what can I do to keep my mind healthy, keep my, my mental health in play. And gardening is a great way to do that. Uh, vegetable gardening for, for so many reasons that I just mentioned. So the pandemic did bring an increase of people, I would say, um, but not for the reason maybe that you think so. No, that makes that makes sense. I, I even said, how, how can gardening help us through the mental aspects of something like the pandemic? Um, so yeah, you definitely, you answered that, that question for me. So um, I saw recently a, a raised bed garden that they put in a, a retirement home um, so that the elderly could still reach the garden beds. And it was like helping with Alzheimer's and, and all kinds of, of things. And, and, you know, I've seen adding gardens to, you know, prison situations and what does that do? Um, so yeah, just the, the mental aspect of gardening, I think can just help in so many ways. So. Well, and yeah. we've just, we've just barely scratched the surface. I mean, we've done vegetable gardens at youth detention centers here in Las Vegas, and we've, we haven't even begun to see what gardening can do for a community bringing it together. We've seen it. We, we're starting to scratch the surface of it, but it can, it could be so much more. So. Yeah, um, that, um, I mean, we have a lot of, a lot of designers on the call. Um, oh, Craig, Craig may have, have one with a question. <laughs> I, I actually have a, a question. I think this is a good time to ask it, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a question that says, not everybody has a backyard to grow vegetables. Um, can yeah. you guys talk a little bit about what you could do with either indoor patios or balconies um, yeah. to help them grow? Yeah, actually, thanks, Craig. We get that question a lot. And uh, we have come up with a few uh, ways to help people do that. And I'm going to let Vanessa kind of answer that one since I'm probably hogging the mic more. But go ahead, Vanessa, with our, <laughs> our grow bags and stuff and all that. So, yeah, um, we do. We do offer grow bags, um, you know, as as an alternative to um, container gardening. Um, you know, really, it's kind of identifying um, what is accessible to you as far as like light and space. Um, there's a lot of crops that love the shade. Um, there are certain crops that really just love the sunlight. Um, so kind of figuring out what what your situation serves you. Um, you know, we also um, have community garden spaces where you can come and work in the garden and um, you know, experience that garden um, without having to, you know, have it at your house, um, which is, is a great resource to have. Um, we do classes and volunteer days. And, um, and so we have two garden spaces that we, we share uh, with our community. And that's at uh, the San Miguel Community Garden, which is off of um, Rancho and Gowan. And then our other is at the uh, Craig Ranch Regional Park. Um, Soon to be three, three yeah, extreme. yeah, yeah, and so um, you know, so an opportunity to grow in the soil is definitely there. Um, but again, as far as growing in your own space, um, you know, using grow bags, um, you know, we can educate you on on how to do that um, most efficiently. There's also um, like aeroponic systems that they sell, um, and which are like a like a hydroponic tank and that filters the water up that you can use indoors in a small space. They come with lights. And so there's definitely ways, um, you know, we we focus a lot on permaculture and, um, you know, being able to use the resources that are already provided to us. Um, and so, you know, we we do mess around with hydroponics here and there, but soil is our, our number one. Um, just because when it comes to hydroponic systems, now you're using more resources, electricity to run the pumps and run the lights and, you know, and the, the filtration system is, is you know, it's, it, it can get expensive. Um, but, you know, that said, it's it's possible. Um, there's, there's ways to get around um, small spaces, definitely. Yeah, and it might be a good time to mention, like Vanessa said, that we're not opposed to hydroponics. We've got a few hydroponic systems that we manage for people as well. But soil is something that a small child, a kindergartner can do um, without a degree in chemistry mm -hmm. by just putting a seed in the dirt and watering it, per se. Um, however, and hydroponics is somewhat limiting, you know, it's crop, it's what you can grow and when you can grow it is somewhat limiting where soil is uh, much more broad and a little bit easier to take to the masses than uh, hydroponics is. However, 
there's been some major technological advances made in hydroponics. And so we're, we're just kind of uh, moving with that at its pace, you know, as it, as it increases and improves, I'm sure we'll adopt uh, the things in there that are, are their best, so. Yeah, you guys kind of touched on the, the question of, you know, what kind of methods work, work best in, in, in our desert, which is obviously not easy, but not impossible. You guys are showing that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just water, water conscious um, gardening and, and how, how can it be done? Mm -hmm. you know, it's, the, it's the hot topic right now. So yeah, yeah. It would, it'd be great to get some advice on that. So uh, thanks for that question. It is a hot topic. I will say one of our one of our proudest moments was we were influential in helping the water district allow rebate money to be used to replace grass with vegetable gardens. Uh, I mean, it's in the early days of the rebate, vegetable gardens didn't qualify. They had to be trees and shrubs and you know the traditional landscaping that replaced uh, and vegetable garden didn't check the box and we helped kind of get that changed. So now if you want to take your grass out and put vegetable gardens in, you'll get the you'll get the rebate. Um, but that being said, so we are water conscious. And I would say really just simply we use drip irrigation, which is the most water conservation type of irrigation you can use. Um, and uh, we use all the pressure regulating emitters with the low flow valves and just a traditional typical drip irrigation system. But we do use a special tubing and we do use it in a way, we place it in the garden that we think is the best way. Um, it's not saying we're not open to other ideas that are out there, but we've done them all. We have tried all of the systems that are out there and this is the way we do it seems to be the best for, for people to be able to germinate seeds in their garden direct so, as well as have them irrigate the entire space consistently and so. Um, but basically, our gardens are very drought tolerant. They they do not use hardly any water. I mean, they, in in most cases, um, we can put the garden right onto the landscape irrigation and just have it run along with the landscaping. So, whatever the trees and shrubs are getting watered at, the garden can get watered at that too. So, yeah, I think that that's a common misconception that gardens take a lot more water. Um, which is just simply not the case. Um, we, you know, we build lots of backyard gardens. I mean, that's like, you know, a, a core of our company is, is building gardens in people's backyards. So that said, we share irrigation timers with everyone's landscaping. And, you know, if it were to have a desert, you know, rock landscaping versus a garden, sure, you're going to use more garden in the water in the garden but if you're growing you know all your ornamental shrubs and then you have your garden there you're using the same amount of water Pretty we're much. watering the same amount of time mm. um and you know it's really and, and using our drip irrigation system um you know it takes the water right where it needs it and um you know and it's really we we adapt our our garden technique to our climate so we don't just grow anything we grow you know every every season we fine tune and you know times are changing as well and the seasons are changing and after every single season we revise our planting list we say what does well what what is like really drought tolerant and what is really efficient to use during this time of year and um, the crops that we select, which are a lot, there's a lot that you can grow here. Mm -hmm. um, it's they're pretty, they're pretty in line with the the amount of water that you're going to use in an ornamental garden. So it's like, why not just use water at something that you can eat? Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah, it yeah. still looks beautiful. I mean, you know, gardens do take work, and um, there are certain crops that you grow that just aren't always beautiful but there are also plants that you can grow in your ornamental space that look beautiful and are edible as well um and so it's not always like the sacrifice this either or option that you have so you can have both so yeah i love that that segue because um like i said there's tons of designers on the call whether it be on the architectural side or the landscape architecture side and you know how how do we um, how do we replace um, ornamentals with um, edible varieties, and and how do we do it right? Um, what are what are some of those pitfalls that we can avoid um, when designing spaces like that? 
That's a great question. We uh, recently consulted with uh, Stantec on Drake Street Park out in Henderson, which is a huge community garden based park um, surrounded with fruit trees and all of the shrubs are edible uh, landscape shrubs. And we actually contracted with them uh, as a consultant to help them all through the design process. And uh, we're working with the city of Henderson now to uh, further maintain the facility as well. So that so that the, we, we really want the spaces, like you said, we want them to be successful. Um, mm -hmm. If we put gardens in and they just become big weed patches outside of eating the dandelion out of them, like Vanessa said, they're really not much good to us. And they and they're kind of an eyesore too. So we want them to be successful and we also want them to be aesthetically pleasing to the eye. So we designed some really cool spaces, some neat uh, ways to grow vegetables. And then when you incorporate the edible landscape plants into the, you know, which are a lot of ones that you guys are already using in your landscape, you probably don't have rosemary, you know what I mean? Yeah. Bay laurels, we could go down the list, society garlic, all these things that you can eat, uh, but we use them already in landscaping there there's a ton of them uh even even you could even go a step further and, and start getting into the fruit tree world and things like that so um but uh i would say you know if you stopped and look at all the plants that you currently use i mean even cactus and prickly pears and things like that that are very edible most of the time you don't agaves edible you know <laughs> it's kind of you know, other than tequila. So it, you, there's so much out there that is very edible. Um, I mean, there's plenty that aren't as well. Don't don't think that you can plant oleanders everywhere and and uh, in, and eat those, you know, they're poisonous or, you know, Texas mountain laurels or whatever, you know. So there are, there's plenty of poisonous plants out there too. But uh, I think, you know, we have some good lists that we've started that we would be welcome to share with anybody in terms that asked us, we just give them to you, of uh, edible plants. We have kind of a little library that we made with pictures and color photos that uh, we made a couple of years ago to help landscape architects choose plants that are edible, um, that do well here in our climate, so. Um, I'm but, curious for the park you mentioned, is there is there actual, you know, um, interpretive exhibits that show this is an edible plant. Here's how you eat it. You know, does it does it inform the public? It seems yeah. like it's an education issue almost that we just don't know. You know, it, it will be once we're done with it. They're they're in the process okay. of constructing it right now, but they are almost done. Um, if you're familiar with Henderson and you know the Drake Street uh, older community area that they're revitalizing and restoring. They took half of the old Drake Street Park and are turning it into a gigantic community garden space. And uh, it's really cool. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, they they will have uh, ability for people to have an educational, um, you know, opportunity when they stroll through the park, so. Okay. Um. I wanted to um, call back something that you had mentioned about the rebate for um, the water district. Um, I saw that the city of Phoenix has recently funded um, an installation of home gardens through federal grants um, for families who fit within a certain income level. And so I was wondering if there's any other things, you know, that you're aware of for Nevadans, for Nevada businesses. Um, you already mentioned, you know, the rebate, um, which is awesome. I didn't even know that you could replace your grass for, for a garden with a rebate. So mm. is there any other, um, you know, things like that for, for available to us? I'm, I'm not aware of any grants for private residences to uh, put in vegetable gardens. Um, Vanessa, have you heard of any? But I, I don't think that we know of. That, that would be great if you guys are yeah. connected to politicians. Let's, let's, let's mm -hmm. make that happen. Um, yeah. it, would be, it would be neat, especially in the uh, lower income brackets it would be awesome. Yeah, I love Vanessa's term food desert. That one was like, ooh, if you can like, I've never, I've never heard that term. So like is that's um for people that are not around fresh food. Yeah. So yeah. It's actually there's actually some parameters to that term food desert. I'm not sure exactly. Like I think that food has to be within a mile or something of yeah, it to be able to yeah. essentially, essentially um like comfortable walking distance to fresh food. 
Um, and so it's and convenience stores don't count. They don't count. So they have to have a produce section. There has to be fresh fruit and vegetables. So yeah, convenience store that sells pickles or hot dogs in a can doesn't apply. Um, and so, you know, it's anywhere that if now you have to walk, you know, four miles, it's blazing hot, add a couple of kids in there, you know, and it's just becomes really hard to get fresh food. And you're just going to make those choices to go to the gas station that's down the street and buy the can of hot Snickers. dogs and yeah. you know um yeah that that so you would be if that were you that would be qual you'd qualify as living in a food desert so yeah that's a that's a term I had not heard so thanks for for letting us know about that um I um Craig I know I see some questions I don't know if you want to take an opportunity to throw one at us Oh, you're muted real quick. There we go. I'm still muted. Uh, no, you're we, good. Okay. We uh we have quite a few questions, but first I just wanted to just there's a couple of comments that I think are really good. First of all, everybody is really enjoying this. We're getting comments thanking you for taking the time to do this. And um <laughs> Tamika Henry has said she looks forward to working with you guys in the historic West Side soon. Mm -hmm. So there's uh there's some good comments. But one of the questions is um do you do you have an example? of where a neighborhood garden um, has become a place or an event where people come just to be connected. We do. We have a really good example of that, actually. it's uh, The address is 3939 Bradley. It's called the San Miguel Community Garden. Uh, and this is just one. There's others, but this is probably our, our most advanced uh, community gathering type facility. Um, it sits on two acres behind a senior, li not a senior living, an assisted living center. Um, and the assisted living center actually owns the land. Uh, we lease it from them and uh, for for just nothing, basically. Uh, but we uh, maintain and manage this uh, area down there. And the community is welcome. It's open to the community, free to the community. There's no cost to be in it and involved in they have so many different activities and events there. That entire, I would say, all the way from Rancho to, you know, Simmons from Craig down to Cheyenne. That that basically geographic area. Um, they all know where it's at, and they all come and participate. And I mean, I love seeing wheelchair march through there because I know that the seniors are are getting out in there too. So. Um, but if you have a chance to go look at it, it's it's really amazing. It's been around for what five years, maybe a little more. A little more. Yeah. yeah. Anything? There's an orchard and chickens, chickens. and a pizza oven, and we're yep. able to do tons of different events there. And we had um, recently we had a, a program out there with uh, some high school kids um, uh, from the Southeast uh, Technical Academy. Um, they have a culinary program, and so we had police officers come and join the kids and um, they kind of split into groups and to have, you know, positive experience with police officers. Um, they split into groups. We did a huge tour of the garden and the kids all created their own pizza recipes based on uh, the menu of selection that they had in the garden. We just gave the tour and we said, all right, everyone come up with two pizzas as a team. The sheriff was the taste tester and we have a wood burning pizza oven there and we made a bunch of pizzas and it was it was an amazing experience. So that was um, our most recent school garden experience that we had there. But I mean, unlimited potential there. It's, it's such a beautiful space to just spend the day um you know people use it for weddings mm -hmm. people use it for gatherings we've had school kids uh the women's uh women's shelter not shelter it's like a women's mm -hmm. facility just mm -hmm. down the street uh, west care they bring their uh tenant their tenants their uh, occupants there to work in the gardens and stuff uh they just walk over there and work in there and so yeah just and like vanessa said endless really we've had so many events and activities there we can't even begin to tell you so that's just yeah. one we could that's keep going one. we could keep going yeah and you know one one that really just and I just think a lot about our senior centers um that have garden spaces and you know a, a garden space in a senior center all of a sudden becomes a place where people gather outside of like their rec room mm -hmm. um you know if they leave their rooms they're gathering in this you know 
room with fluorescent lights and the TV's blaring. And now there's an actual you know, space outside together to get some sunshine, um, to breathe fresh air and work together. And really we see a lot of involvement and community form in our senior centers where there traditionally wouldn't be none. Um, you know, people go out there and harvest and they'll take them to their friends who are homebound in their rooms. Um, and really I've, I've seen a lot, a lot of really beautiful connection at our senior centers that I really didn't anticipate putting in the gardens. I was like, oh, you know, it's a sense of nurture that comes back to life, you know, but it's just been so much more than that. And ultimately, really, it's been that community aspect that has made the senior centers so successful. Yeah, agreed. That's amazing. Um, I, I had a question to, to, to uh, nope. talk about your guys' most in, inspiring garden moments, but it seems like, yeah, you, you guys would have plenty. <laughs> the list is long. I mean, yeah. from, I mean, when you, when you see a child pull a carrot out of the soil and the smile on their face, it, oh we got pictures galore, videos, tons. I mean, when you see that, it just melts you. you. You just you just really connect with that person. And you, when you know that you help them have that experience, I mean, you know, you never work a day in your life if you love what you do. And I think it's safe to say that we love what we do for sure. Yeah, I have an audio clip saved on my phone from we were doing a chef demo at a school and all of a sudden all the kids started chanting for salad. And they were like, eat some salad. And they were just and I was like, this is incredible. Can I, can you imagine all their parents hearing them chant for salads right now? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's I love that you recorded it. That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Craig, you, you're, you had a, had a question yeah, I was for gonna, us? So, um, the, the, one of the, one of the attendees is asking us, uh, what do you think about permaculture? And I know yeah. That you guys are are uh, understand that and a concept and work within that concept, but maybe you can share a little bit about what permaculture is and then what you guys, you know, how you see it applying within what we do. Yeah, we love permaculture, and I'm going to pass the baton to Vanessa on that one. So yeah. she wants to talk about it. Yeah. So I mean, we see, you know, we see gardening is a manipulation of the land around you, right? I mean, obviously, a whole, um, you know, field of of corn is not just going to grow on its own um, without us, you know, doing that. So bringing in permaculture is a way to kind of create a natural environment in this space that we've created, um, kind of create a, a natural ecosystem that can ultimately take care of itself. Um, how can we most efficiently use this space, whether it's the location and maybe there's some water drainage that collects in this area. So being able to turn that into a rain belt that collects that water, being able to grow in that space without having to kind of uh, funnel anything out of the way, being able to efficiently use that water so it just doesn't create runoff. Um, or from that to, you know, bringing pollinators or beneficial insects to sustain a, a pest-free garden, um, you know, and so looking at ways to kind of recreate these natural systems, I mean, I think just in general, um, when it comes to ornamentals versus growing food, I mean, a lot of times, and this is kind of a, a deep topic to think about, but you know, if you're growing food, you're going to be conscious of what you're putting into the soil, right? And so a lot of times we're creating, when we're growing these ornamentals where it's only the looks that matter, you know, you can start trashing the soil. I'm just going to put whatever chemical in here that's going to make this tree the biggest, the most green, um, the most vibrant, and not really care about what I'm doing to the soil itself. Um, but when you're going to eat from that, you're going to be conscious of what you're putting in there. So, you know, if you're creating uh, an environment that you're going to be, that's going to be nourishing you, you're in turn going to be nourishing that environment as well, because you're going to care about what's going into that. Um, and so, you know, being able to kind of create these environments that um, replicate nature in a way that is conducive to to our earth and not just another way to just trash our resources, um, I think kind of is like the basis for for growing with permaculture in mind. So, 
Ho um, hopefully that yeah. answers your question. But yeah, yeah, short, short, we love it. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so we're actually getting a lot of requests for your plant list that you offered. Yep. I, I'm wondering if perhaps maybe you could give it to us and we'll send mm -hmm. it out to all the attendees with the link that when we send the video yeah. out. Yeah, it's uh, is it too lengthy? It's I'm talking about the one for team. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is quite lengthy, but we, we can we'll, get we'll it figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we okay. might have to use a link or Dropbox or something, but yeah. yeah, we can get it to you. That'd be great. Thank you. So I just got so many questions for that. Or I was gonna, I was gonna request that anyway. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. And it's not done yet. If you guys have other ideas, you know. That's probably yeah, it's a growing, it's a it, living, it's a growing document. list. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's uh, no it definitely, definitely <laughs> is. Unintended. Yeah. Right. Um, there, I think there's an interesting comment that was on here from Anna Peltier, who's a landscape architect. Many of you know. Um, she said, she yeah, says, no, she says, Nevada Plants is a nonprofit that will do free fruit trees for residents. So I didn't know mm -hmm. that. So make sure you write that down, Nevada Plants, and maybe if you want a fruit tree, you got an opportunity to get one. Yeah, I didn't even know that. So thanks, Anna, for letting us know that. So I think that's I, I know pretty oh. much for, for me, Brittany. I'm gonna okay. see if any other ones pop up, but yeah, I was gonna ask Vanessa. Um, I know you mentioned pollinators and another hot topic, you know. Um, I'm not sure if there's any advice you guys could give of, you know, for for us, you know, how do we how do we help um other than not, you know spray chemicals everywhere and 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 plant what we can to feed them um you know is there is there any anything else we can do yeah i mean i think that you know i think that the chemicals is is a problem for sure um and i think that you know kind of creating a space where so I think that there's a, a common misconception about bees um, and, oh, well, I'm allergic to bees. I don't want to bring bees. And so a lot of times, like when we're building gardens for people, um, I hear a lot that like, oh, you know, my husband is allergic to bees, so we can't have any flowers. Like we can't have anything that's going to attract bees. And, you know, that's, it just kind of doesn't, work like that um and really the the kind of bees that you think about when you think of like my girl you know you know, like throwing the yeah. rock at the hive and you know that's it's different i mean honeybees and solitary bees are different right. solitary bees are the ones that are going to come visit your garden unless your neighbor has a beehive next door you're not going to really be getting those bees that are tend to be more aggressive so honeybees mm -hmm. are protecting their hive. They, they have something valuable there to protect. They have their queen. They're going to be more defensive. Um, whereas solitary bees, they live in very small units, um, like four to six in a family. And so they actually are going out when they're going out to the garden, they're gathering food for, for their little units. And they have a lot to sacrifice by losing their life right, or stinging you, um, they know what's going to happen. And so actually solitary bees, and it's not kind of the same. If you get stung or bitten by a solitary bee, it's actually not the same as like a, a wasp bite or honeybees where they're aggressive and they'll kind of come and attack. Um, and so really solitary bees are nothing to fear. I mean, I'll have a basil plant covered with flowers and I'll just reach my hand in there. There'll be a bunch of bees buzzing around and the kids will be freaking out and I'll just grab go gently I mean as long as they know that you're not trying to attack them um they're not going to be an issue and so I think number one is like not fearing that um but it's I mean they're obviously they say that every every third bite that we take um is brought to you by a bee right so um you know it's they're very important and so while creating these gardens and these um places you know these landscapes in your yard put in flowers put in things that are going to attract bees and don't just swarm everything with pesticides i mean people get scared of bugs and so then they start spraying for other bugs not thinking that sure it's going to work 
the pesticides for all the ants and all the aphids and everything they're putting on your roses and everything, it's going to help, but it's also going to hurt the beneficial insects as well. Um, and so, you know, kind of coming back to permaculture, creating an environment where maybe bring in ladybugs if you're having an aphid problem. And so they could take care of the aphids for you and you don't have to start resorting to chemicals to kill everything that you see. Um, I think that that's a major issue. Um, you know, I, I think there's much more to um, the danger of bees than, than us, um, like spraying our gardens. But I think, you know, plant some flowers, create a place where, you know, um, you can have, uh, you know, these pollinators come and have a place to, to collect some food. Um, I think that's, that's pretty easy to do. Um, flowers are beautiful. And um, yeah, it's just a small thing that everyone can do and, and not be afraid of them. <laughs> your garden, your garden will do much better if you can introduce pollinators to it. Uh, but you know, we, in addition to that too, we also practice IPM and we really try to minimize any type of chemical used at all. Even the organic ones, we try to use best practices in all situations and we teach organic methods and all that. So uh, it, it, it all comes together, it all plays a role. Um, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And we fix a lot of people's wrong ways. Yes, I, and and how do you uh, discern the friend from foe bugs? It's like sometimes uh, you just you just don't yeah. know is this a good one or not. We get that a lot. I mean, people yeah. send pictures constantly. It's like, and they'll just say friend or foe, and I, I just <laughs> know because I've seen them hundreds and thousands of times, so I just know. But uh, I think part of it is just asking the question to experts and finding out. Um, and and we get. You know, people, I remember this one time, this lady was super scared of ladybug larva and she thought it was a, a, just a most terrible bug in her garden. And, they do and look weird, yeah. They, they do, do <laughs> but you know, we, we, we were able to help her and just teach her, look, that's a friend and the larva eats the aphids, the adult eats the aphids. And so in every yeah. stage. So anyways, yeah. that answers that question. And another quick question from the audience. Uh, are there varieties to recommend for indoor environments to help clean the air? Um, you know, all plants, whether any, any plant inside uh, an indoor environment is going to help clean the air. Um, and so the more plants, the better. Uh, remember that plants help us with our oxygen uh, and they recycle. Their roots need oxygen. Their leaves need carbon dioxide but they produce oxygen, you know, for us, their byproduct is oxygen for us to breathe. So um, that's going to improve an indoor environment, of course. Um, but in terms of a plant cleaning the air, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any specific plant that would clean the air other than all plants, as I described previously. Well, I know we're we're getting towards the the end of our time here. Um, I wanted to um, I wanted to learn how anyone on the call can support the two of you and and your organization. I know Nessa is on the foundation side, so maybe if we can just understand how do how do we support? How do we get involved? Yeah, that's great. And thank you again for having us. We have thoroughly enjoyed it. We love talking about these types of things. Um, and, and Vanessa actually does more than just the foundation. She actually runs Garden Farms of Nevada as well in terms of she's our general manager in there as well. And so she, she really is the, the, the main contact. If you email the info uh, line on our website, it, that email comes straight to me. So and I, I can forward that or reply to it if I if I want. Or you can just email us directly Brian at GardenFarms.net and Vanessa at GardenFarms.net. And it's Brian with a Y. But uh, really, if I could, just since you guys are designers and architects, um, we, we have found it to be most successful when projects that you're working on, if you could simply just consult with us in its early stages, we can really help. Um, you know, you talked about Alexander Dawson School and all these parks and this and that. In, may, in all those cases, we've been able to consult with the architect, whether it's the main architect or the landscape architect, in advance to try to help so that the garden goes in the right location. It's not up against a south facing wall. It's actually has exposure to sunlight. It has good soil. Good soil, good irrigation, you know, and we, like with Drake Street 
you know, Stan Tech, who I'm sure many of you guys work with, or, 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 or at least they're in your industry, we consulted with them right down to the very detail pages that they were drawing, you know, the type of irrigation they were using and stuff. And so it really can kind of prevent a lot of things going wrong in the future, you know, down the road, if you'll take the time to consult with us or someone else. Um, but we can, we can kind of save you that headache if, uh, if I could just make that pitch, you know, to the, to the designers in the room. So. Yeah, definitely. I know I, for one, um, would love to involve you guys in, in everything that we do. So um, hopefully a lot more um, in the future, we get some opportunities to, to do some work together. So mm -hmm. that, would, that would be great. great. All right. And with that, um, I wanted to thank you both so much. Um, we appreciate your, your afternoon, uh, you spending it with us. Um, I wanted to share a closing uh, screen here. So um, yes, uh, keep an eye out for our next webinar. Uh, we're thinking it might be the last one for the year. So um, it will probably be a November timeframe. Um, in fact, if you have a, a great topic, that you think um, would be great for the next fireside chat, send it our way. Uh, we're always looking for um, new new topics that um, are interest to you know all of our attendees. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and like we said, we will follow up with um, the email that will include the link to this uh, recorded webinar as well as um, some of the resources that Brian and Vanessa mentioned today. So we'll be sure and and get with them and and include that for you. So thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, attending. And thanks so much for Vanessa and Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.